Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Sharp Syrup Shots Gaming. I can't say that for the life of me, can I? <laughs> Not today, apparently. It's like syrup. Yep, yep. It's like a podcast, but don't we? God. Yeah. S H Y R U P. Syrup. <laughs> it's like a question mark. Shots gaming. There we go. Well, you, you said with... it like a guy is having a case of Bell's palsy or something. <laughs> Not intentionally. <laughs> yep. Well, with me today is Phil. Hey. Dave. Hello. And Chris. Hola. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure how much longer we're gonna have Chris with you know little one on the way. Yep. Yep. That's right. Get get used Wednesday. to playing mobile games. <laughs> oh. <laughs> switch. Use the switch. <laughs> Use the switch. Get a get a little crib rocker that you can rock with your foot. <laughs> we, we, we we do have a we 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 set up the the swing and there is a it detaches and and you can use it as a rocker. So nice, All Dave. Set. You think I was joking? James actually did that. No, I know, I know. <laughs> I remember him telling us that. <laughs> uh, oh, things we can learn. That's great. Well, we're excited oh. for this week's episode. This mm -hmm. week's episode is going to get into a little bit deeper topic than we've done before. This is going to be part of our series called The Line. As in, where do you draw the line when you can no longer support a game or developer or publisher? But before we get into that, let's talk about our gaming gripes. Anyone got any major gaming gripes this week? Um, I guess I got a minor one. Um, I just noticed this coming up recently. And on the one hand, it, it can be kind of a positive, but on the other hand, it has made things uh, also a bit of a pain in the butt. But has any of you noticed that when you're trying to order a game on Amazon, you like punch in the name of the game you're looking for and suddenly three results come up? And it's because it's selling you actually three different ones, but it's from like three different geographical locations around mm -hmm. the globe. And so, you know, not necessarily the first one you click on is going to be the one that you're necessarily looking for. So for perspective, uh, I finally decided to get a copy of uh, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker for the Switch. I, nice. I have it for the Wii U, but the Switch version is more complete, and they had the special uh, Mario Odyssey-themed uh, levels, and then they added DLC, which was never in the original. So I'm like, you know, I want that one. Um, and it's also, it's not too expensive, but I was looking at it on Amazon and I kept only finding the, uh, the UK version with the Peggy rating on it. And, uh, then I jump and looked elsewhere, excuse me. And, uh, I'm only finding the, uh, Asian version, uh, with the zero rating. I could not find the American one to save my life. So finally, uh, I just had to get on eBay and uh, order it there. And, you know, not necessarily that it's a bad thing because there has been situations though where sometimes you can get a better deal by ordering it from another country. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the consoles now are uh, region free. Now, that doesn't mean that you can always necessarily do uh, the uh, DLC because of coding practices and stuff like that. But it has made it nice in some occasions. But I just wish, though, it used to be if I wanted, you know, another region's copy of a game, I had to set that as my settings on Amazon. And now it's just they're throwing everything on there. And it, I just found it a little annoying. <laughs> now, out of curiosity here, with you being a collector, does that impact mm -hmm. your decision on which version you get? Like, are you trying to get just the American or a version's a version that doesn't really matter to you? Uh, depends on what it is. Uh, usually, I'll try and get the American version, just uh, just for you know, knock on wood, I, to make sure I know it will work on the system. And even then, uh, some of these you know, foreign games, uh, the foreign versions, they still might not necessarily have an English language track in it. Now that hasn't been a problem for some because like. I was finally able to pick up a copy of Gravity Rush Remastered, physical edition, uh, off of eBay, but it was the Asian uh, version. But since 
that it means it's being released in Singapore, where English is the primary language. You know, <laughs> I just pop the disc in, and it's just it's the same game. It's just I think literally it is the same disc, but the packaging is still you know the Singapore uh, packaging. Mm. So I lucked out with that, you know, because here that was an Amazon exclusive, which is long since gone. Well, they didn't they didn't make that many physical copies of that game. Exactly, <laughs> and uh, but also though it you know. And uh, I'm not like a completist or anything, or like uh, in terms of like, you know, they all have to look the same, like, you know, but like, it's kind of funny, though, for Christmas, I, I had finally requested uh, Hyrule Warriors, the complete edition. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad had ordered it off of Amazon. And because of this situation, he ordered me the Peggy edition. Uh, now, okay. it's fine, because there's no DLC for that game. Uh, it is a complete on version, on cartridge version, and it loaded up just fine. You know, it was the UK version, so it's all in English. And it even uh, downloaded the one update for the game, but still, it was just kind of like, Amazon, what are you doing? <laughs> or are you just letting your sellers kind of run wild with this? Wild West. I, I, yep, I just kind of wish that there was maybe like a little descriptor on it, you know, like they have to specify... Oh, this is you know the uh, region two or the region three version. Not that it matters so much anymore, but it still would just be kind of nice. Yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you, that one guy in the commercial. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Yeah, you. <laughs> you fix it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> or I'll tell everyone you molest the packages. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That gets this the Aqua Turtle. Uh, all right. Sorry, Phil. I interrupted you with, <laughs> okay. with my molesting of packages, Joe. <laughs> Every time I get an Amazon package, now I'm like, Hadouken! Steve, the package molester strikes again. <laughs> Actually, if I get a package that's been beaten up a little bit, I'm like, oh, oh I don't know what happened here. <laughs> Oh, Steve got a hold of this one too. Jeez. <laughs> so, uh, I had a small one. I noticed, uh, I didn't say I noticed, BlizzCon was, was kind of my gripe this week with uh, them announcing IPs that have been beaten to absolute death. Mm. Like, I know they had already announced Diablo 4, and just to add to the nostalgia, they're bringing back the Rogue, which was a character from Diablo 1 that has been away. And I noticed in the reveal trailer, I actually didn't even finish it, but I noticed at the very beginning of it, the Rogue was showing a collection of her ears, which was a thing you could do in the first Diablo, which is if you killed another player, you could collect their ears and stuff like that. So they're just milking all the nostalgia there, and then to just top oh. things off, they're doing Diablo 2 Remastered, and I'm just... Mm -hmm. But small gripe, but it was just like, yeah, come up with something new, guys. Also, I mean, I'll piggyback on your your gripe and and claim it as my own as well. But I I don't really understand why they felt like they had to do um this convention announce the whole thing. It they didn't really have anything to announce, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they really didn't. Um, the the trailer for Diablo Four was was fine. Um, the all, I think that was really new is the rogue character like you were talking about. Um, and they gave us a little bit more information about Overwatch 2. That was probably the biggest thing that came out of it Oh, yeah. That, did yeah. you watch that full 40-minute thing on Overwatch 2? I watched pieces of it. I have not. <laughs> Ooh, it, it... The best way I can describe it is they've taken lessons, and it's like they're taking Destiny 2, Left 4 Dead, and Overwatch, <laughs> and making a baby. Oh, oh my! It turned out really cool. There, there's some neat ideas that are doing that they're doing. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I'm just I, I guess that just didn't run across my feed recently because I haven't, I haven't really touched Overwatch too much. Even though I love the world and the characters, uh, you know, and I got the art books and stuff. But you know. You know, I guess I really stopped playing that game probably about a year and a half ago, you know, regularly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the last time we booted it up, it's just like, who's Baptiste? 
So the, when, when did we get rid of the defense characters? <laughs> so a couple of things that I really liked uh, that they kind of talked about with Overwatch 2 is mm -hmm. for the player versus enemy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have what are called hero missions. Uh, they all take place in the multiplayer maps, but instead of you going against other players, you go against enemy like uh, computer generated enemies. And they're mm -hmm. like waves and waves of robots. Uh, mm -hmm. But they're going to do variations of these. So there's going to be like hundreds of these. So you could always play it in a different way. So oh, okay. some, nice. like say there's a payload map. Sometimes the payload's going to go a different way than it would normally go. But you wouldn't know that okay. until you got into the mission. There's also going to be a story. Sorry, go ahead, Phil. I, say, I think they delve into that a little bit too with uh, with Overwatch 1. There was a, uh, like there was a seasonal match where it was a PvE uh it was supposed to set i think it was supposed to be like a prequel mission of mm -hmm. uh like the overwatch team first gets together and i'm, I'm drawing a blank on all the details where i think you could play as reinhardt and tracer and i, I know exactly Tracer's which one you're talking about yeah yeah and torbjorn i think was in there yeah it was, it's, it was similar it was like a horde mode for overwatch you had to survive so many waves and uh protect a payload or something like that i, I can't remember but but yeah i think they had like tapped into that a little bit yeah and i think that was kind of beta testing for what they're doing now but yeah. they're bringing it to the umpteenth level. So they're going to have, you know, grunt enemies and then elite versions of the grunt enemies. So, like, normal grunt enemies, if you kill them, they, they just fall apart. The elite versions, they're going to be harder to kill. They'll shoot in bursts instead of single shots. And once you and kill them, them, they'll crawl to you and explode. Yeah. Yeah, which, is, which is cool. Yeah, I'm all about yeah, horde it, mode. Is there any uh, single player? Uh, there is a there's a there's Ooh. a story campaign as well. Yes, excellent. Well, that's what I'd like to hear. And I love Overwatch on... One, but I I wanted some some more story. Although the cinematics were wonderful, you know, it still doesn't you know change the pl uh, take the place of you know you know being a part of it as opposed to just watching it. <laughs> yeah, uh, and they also dived into leveling up characters, so they'll have different arching paths for different abilities yeah, there's okay. gonna be like a skill tree and there's like for each character they'll have like three different sets i i for way i was reading and watching about it it sounds like you can get you can mix and match still but mm -hmm. there's three major trees that i imagine will mm -hmm. be the three options when you're doing pvp oh okay yeah i got gotcha. you um, that's that's cool i'll have to watch that yeah um so Phil and Chris, I'm actually gonna play devil's advocate a little bit for you against you guys here. I was super excited about the Diablo two announcement because I missed Diablo two when it came out. I've never played it. Yeah, that's fair. That, that mm. is fair. Um, and, and and I know it's not their main team working on it. It's a, it is know, historically known as the best Diablo. And uh, I gotta go along with Tyler. They're really the only experience I had with Diablo two or Diablo in general, was playing Diablo 3 with you guys. Yeah. And um, yeah. I, I mean, I watched Doug uh, play Diablo and Diablo 2, you know, from over his shoulder watching the computer, and it always looked cool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had nothing against it. And, uh, I mean, I even oh. found out some cool stuff about the lore, and what I did find cool, though, is, you know, at a comic convention, I went and saw the, uh, the fantasy artist uh, Brom, who does all the, did all the original teams for diablo and what's cool is uh now who is on the cover of diablo 2 is that diablo is he the skull-faced gentleman with the hole right here uh yeah yeah, so, yeah okay. i remember correctly he's on one of them and then i think for the expansion it's bail okay well either way he painted that picture and you know on the original cover you don't see the hole in the skull mm -hmm. And the thing was, the cover that they're showing now, they got the, you know, the whole front and center. Um, they couldn't, sh they had him edit the painting that he did originally, which showed that, you know, way back when Diablo 2 came out. Uh, but they had to edit it because shortly before it happened, Columbine happened. Ah. And they didn't want to necessarily have, you know, like a skull with a bullet hole looking you know, through the head. And so now that it's been probably, what, 25 years since, I think they're now like, you know, well, now knowing the story, because then is it supposed to be like a stone that was in his head or something? Yeah, so the uh, the plot was that 
for Diablo 2, uh, Diablo was actually the hero from the first game who was the Wanderer. And he killed the, the Diablo then, who was, uh, they used the Soul Stone to, to basically get power. He thought that if he jammed it in his own forehead, which was that was where they kept it, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. But by doing that, he thought he could control it. And he became a wanderer being drawn from the power and it was taking him a certain direction. And the plot was that, uh, spoiler alert, but the plot was that he was trying to find the other uh, soul stones who were the, like, the three prime evils. And uh, that was essentially what he was doing. And at, like, towards the end of the game, he becomes like Diablo. But so like it's supposed to be like, the, he's the Lord of Terror and it was supposed to be the, the hero from the first game as the one who becomes the, the, the villain in the second game. I see. Okay. Yep, that's what that's what I thought. But it's just it's kind of fun to see that come full circle. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, for me though, that's that again is my only experience watching my brother and seeing that uh, convention uh, special with Brom. And uh, so you know, now I'm kind of interested because you know I get to see you know that and I I know those things. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of cool for me though. You know, finally being able to kind of pick up. Uh, you know, where most people started with the series and kind of know what's going on. And that's kind of a fair point, because I know one of my gripes with Blizzard is that they tend to rehash their, their titles and they rehash their storylines, where it's just like there's this there's this evil villain that nobody knows about that comes lurking from the shadows, and then everybody has to team up to fight him. But then when they team up, there's a they team up with somebody else, and there's another evil villain that's coming out of the shadows. Mm -hmm. It's just rinse and repeat a lot of the times. But for people like me, like I grew up playing Blizzard and Warcraft and Diablo mm -hmm. and Starcraft and all that. Um and I guess I forget, yeah, you know, I forget that other people haven't played it as much as I have. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's that's a, I think a fair criticism of Diablo in general, though. Like, yeah, they um, I love those games. They're a heck of a lot of fun. But um, I, a lot of their story and plot is very much classic archetypes, and um, they do reuse their own plot lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still a fun game. It's a mm -hmm. video oh. game. Oh, yeah. And I, I think I've I've come to equate like a lot of Blizzard games that come out now to be kind of the Michael Bay of video games. Like they're not <laughs> overly like detailed in terms of plot, but good good gameplay, good fun action. You know, they're, they're easy to pick up and enjoy. Um, and but not much much depth in terms of like character development or anything like it's 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 pretty like like Chris said they're pretty typical archetypes. Yeah, and that's where they they spend all their time on progression, right? Um, right. Man, they were they mastered that kind of like loot mechanic mm -hmm. that that oh I gotta get my my fix right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy in this corner. Uh, <laughs> uh, other direction, Dave. Oh, <laughs> on my screen you're in this okay. corner. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if if you point if if you pointed the other direction up, that's actually me. Uh oh. So here. Yep. Uh, there we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Guilty. Tyler. For those of you who are listening, it's Tyler <laughs> I was referencing. Because that is his. Uh, that is his heroin. Is uh, loot drops in gaming. I. I. My name is Tyler, and and I'm addicted to loot drops. <laughs> Sir, this is Walgreens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I've got one gaming graph I want to add real fast here, and then we can get into the main topic. And it is to no. do with the Smash Brothers announcement this week. I know Dave is already looking very cautious of what I'm about to say. My gripe is how the fan base has been so upset about Pyramidra. Okay, now I'm good. I had my, <laughs> I had my shiv ready to go, but um, yeah, that no, that, no, that yeah. wasn't bother me at all. I mean, I'm a yeah. Xenoblade uh, fan. Oh, and, uh, to see Xenoblade two get uh, representation in Smash that didn't bother me at all. That didn't bother and, me at all either. I, I also don't mind the fact that they altered the costumes to make it, you know, uh, less fan servicey. Oh, they because, altered I mean, them a lot. Yeah. It wasn't as much as you would. They basically put uh, 
fishnets on one and then uh, covered some cleavage and put a pair of leggings on the other. And that I was like, okay, that's fine, you know? Uh, some thing, cleavage, I'm Dave? Getting, yeah? Some cleavage? Okay, well, a lot of cleavage. But... It, there was a lot in the original. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there is. <laughs> now, I've, I, I have played uh, Xenoblade Chronicles 1, but I haven't played 2 yet, so I'm just oh. going off of the art that has been shown. I was just looking at the compare and contrast image. No, but... 2, two is definitely way more fan service than the original Xenoblade. Mm-hmm. Um... The one thing I am getting sick and tired, though, is everyone's just like, oh, another anime sword fighter? God. And I just, I'm also sick of hearing the qualifying term on their anime. And I'm just kind of like, okay, now technically, if an, isn't it if they were, you know, created in Japan and is a cartoon? Isn't that anime? You know, isn't that how that works? I mean, you can I, even I stress just, that, even you can even stretch that out because they consider things like Ruby R W B Y as being mm-hmm. anime. That's U.S. made. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Yeah. anime uh, anime has its, has taken on a different definition. Um, so it that's really what has because because you have like you know Avatar: the Last Airbender and Legend of Korra, which are not made in Japan by Japanese. Which, which I don't consider they're, anime they're, at all. That, that are that are considered mm-hmm. anime. There's a bunch of like the um netflix anime <laughs> stuff that's that's on there that's actually made by eastern europeans um mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. it's like a style of animation is really what's commonly referred to as anime nowadays i know and i guess Better that's what, that's what's bugging me though because it's just like guys like 98 percent of that cast is anime why are you complaining so much but i guess it's just like you know, oh, we didn't grow up with it, you know, so we don't recognize it as that, you know. Like, I'm sorry, Super Mario is anime, you know. They have had anime specials, manga comics, since its inception. Um, the only ones really in there that are not, that are, but, you know, were designed in a style that has now since been adapted. Diddy Kong and King K. Rule were designed by Rare, which was a British company. Mm-hmm. But were then designed, redesigned by Nintendo to fit in with their proper aesthetics. And uh, Steve. <laughs> and Banjo Kazooie, a... right? Oh, that's right. Banjo, but that's another rare one, though. Yep. Yes. Uh, yep. So th- there's four. Yep. <laughs> and I, I didn't hear this argument at all when Sephiroth was announced last time. <laughs> and if there was ever. An anime sword fighter of anime sword fighters. It's him. <laughs> I would agree and with I that. I didn't hear crap about well, that. Then. The, the, the thing about it is, is um, people don't. It, that's what their argument is, but that's mm. not really what their argument is. Oh yeah, no. it's mostly just like the character I wanted from such and such game didn't come in. I'm like, guys, here's the thing. You know, it, we're never gonna get everyone in there. And no matter your reason of why you think they should be in there, yes, it might be a good reason, it might be a garbage reason, but there's still a whole bunch of legal hurdles that have to get over to actually uh, get things in there. I mean, that's why, like, the Final Fantasy VII music was only two tracks for, you know, two years after the game was released until finally the legal hurdles have been cleared. That is why there's actually no Minecraft music in the game. It is Minecraft Dungeons music. Mm-hmm. Yep. And actually, you bring up a good point. We were watching uh, Ready Player One last night, and uh, we were trying to spot all the Easter eggs and the characters that you see like from different games. Mm-hmm. And we were looking it up. But I, I remember, at least, I'm not sure if the voices were quite as loud back then, if the, if the people were quite as unhappy with Ready Player One's like references, but I remember there being at least a small amount of people who were unhappy with some of the changes they made for the movie versus the book. Like, the mm-hmm. book had Ultraman in it, and the, but the movie uses Iron Giant. And I looked it up, and apparently a lot of people were actually, a lot of creators, I should say, were for their characters being in the movie, but the issue was that a lot of them had legal battles of who had the rights to it. So it was it, it was harder to get the rights to display it in the movie. And so they, uh, when I read in the trivia, looking it up on IMDb, as we always do for, for when we're watching movies, mm-hmm. 
apparently the 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 guys filming the movie were like, well, that they couldn't get the rights for a certain character, they just saw it as an opportunity to try to figure out who would be the next best thing in this scene or in that mm-hmm. moment. But anyway, just circling back to what you were saying, a lot a lot of people get bent out of shape about characters not being in certain things they think it should be, but really it's not about a, a lack of creativity, it's about a lack of rights. Like, mm-hmm. they can't get the, mm-hmm. get past the copyright. Yeah. And, and some of those are just so held up because, you know, and this is coming from, like, personal experience because uh you know i i illustrated a novel years ago and uh, the reason for that why i was approached to do that i was asked to recreate historical photos but i was not allowed to actually you know use the re- i was allowed to use them as reference but i could not recreate the photos because and it is not even necessarily a case where really the person making the argument has a case or you know things like that but they have enough clout to muddy the waters that they could hold something up in court and you know that's oftentimes not what you know they they they, they just don't want to bother with that because you know you know it, it, it's it's a video game at the end of the day yes it would be you know probably creatively a lot of fun to have um you know some of these characters in there, but then, you know, oftentimes you might run into like problems. It's just like, well, maybe the company that originally made it is out of business and, you know, maybe no one bought up the license. Well, then licensed then would probably, well, it could uh, divert to a number of people who had hands in it. And so then you got to be like, okay, actually, well, then who owns the license? Well, it could be several people. Oh, maybe they're dead. Well, then no one owns it. You know? So, point so, of trivia, do, do, do you know who you can blame? For the the legal issues for intellectual property in the United I do. States, I do. <laughs> Tyler, you had your hand up first. Um, Walt blipping Disney. Mm-hmm. Is is it, was it really Walt or was it his company? It no, it was, was Walt. actually Walt Disney. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What's the story behind that? I don't think I've heard. He wanted to copyright well, uh, the actual figure of uh, or character Mickey Mouse for a longer period than what was allowed at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, he convinced the courts to where you can hold on to the rights for a much longer period of time. Before it goes mm-hmm. into the public domain. Yes. Yep. yep. Interesting. Uh, so, fun fact, going back to Ready Player One, Phil. Mm-hmm. The, so, in the book, uh, each of the four of the of or each of the characters of the high five had gotten yeah. their own uh robots in that movie or in the in the book mm. um it would have been really difficult to do the main character's robot because i don't even know who they'd have to go to for rights it was, was the mech? it was the mech for spider man the japanese spider-man that's right yeah <laughs> i don't remember that i read wow. I, the audio book. I don't remember what is yeah so do you, do you go to the uh, the right. company that made that in Japan? Do you go to old school Marvel? Do you go to Disney? Do you have yeah. to go to all of them and get them all to agree? <laughs> it, it's probably... And if you ever want like a good example of why, how messed up some of this can be, I, I urge our, our listeners to read up on the history of the licensing of Robotech. That will explain everything. It'll explain so much. That is another podcast in itself. Like, that could be a history podcast with 50 installments. Sure. That's... Not that I want to... That, that That's the Robotech and Macross. Isn't that what that's about? Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. So, now... One last thing to go back to the original conversation. I th- I think there's another concern people had with the anime sword fighter. It doesn't really have to do with it being anime. It's more the sword fighter front because mm-hmm. we got a lot of Fire Emblem characters that are down B counter, forward B kind of movement attack, uh, st- uh, neutral B charge, and up B slash. They were mm-hmm. very, very similar. Ike, Marth, Roy, Lucina, they all played very similar to each other. I think people are just concerned about getting too many players that play the same. Mm-hmm. 
that's no, fair. And that's that fair. I can understand. Yeah. Yeah, but they that's need to clarify issue. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It, it's one thing to just say I'm tired of anime sword fighters. It's another thing. Come on, you know, bring a better argument to the table. I, I'm gonna, not gonna lie. I was kind of disappointed they didn't bring in Doom Guy. Doom Guy seemed to make the most sense with Animal Crossing coming out last year, with it, and Doom <laughs> Crossing being a thing for for uh, for a couple of months into the pandemic. Like I, I thought, well, they've already got an Animal Crossing villager in the game. It'd be perfect if they did something with Doom Guy and the Animal Crossing villager on like a trailer. I, I was kind of hoping for that. Now I would not be surprised though if that would be like the surprise me skin for you know one of these next yeah characters because you know they're releasing new set of uh, me costumes each time and we've gotten some fun stuff from that like a uh, bump boy altair from assassin's creed and i think that's where they're willing to play and put mature franchises so i would not be surprised to see the classic you know green power armor with the with the six pack so you can see the meat display going on, you know, and you know, on the cover of the original game, I would love to see that. That would be hysterical with this big old uh, bobble guy head going on. Well, Tag think match of him and, uh, sorry, go ahead, Phil. I was, I was just think about the opportunities it would create for, for enemies to be added in as, uh, as like, uh, what are they for the trophies for the spirits? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, have demons for spirits, yep. basically. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, mean, I got the Taco Demon spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. So okay, let's talk I about something a little more depressing than hell. Yeah, because I was about. To... <laughs> uh, oh, that's great. Uh, I was about to say we've probably gone off way off topic a bit. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, big topic of the night here is where do you draw the line for game companies as in you won't purchase from them anymore. They've crossed the line that you can no longer support them with their political and social actions. So let's start with the news of the week. At the beginning of this, me and Dave were kind of gushing about, ooh, Diablo, ooh, Overwatch. Yeah. But Activision mm -hmm. Blizzard has done some not so great things, you know. The the well, twenty years that has been the COVID pandemic mm. had us has had us forget about you know Hong Ki Hong Kong the uh, liberation of our time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where and they I, I, that's... save Hong Kong now or be Hong Kong tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, now this is a tough one for me because we also discussed earlier, you know with you know what is the line but the problem with the line is is that you know i can be totally against and, and mostly i would say this is a situation with activision's blizzards the head honchos the boss because they also now have a controlling interest in uh activision blizzard uh, bleh. tencent the company which is one of the big publishers out of china but is also funded by the Chinese government, bought a share, sizable share, of Activision Blizzard. So they have a controlling interest. In it. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, All Tencent right. also owns Riot Games, which which I know we don't ever talk about on, mm -hmm. on, on this um, podcast at all, but that's League mm -hmm. of Legends, which is massive. Um, mm -hmm. Especially in the esports community, that is a mm -hmm. massive one. And uh, so for me, you know, I can be angry at the bosses, but, you know, Tyler also brought up the, the great point, though, you know, you know, there still are, you know, the developers and the artists and everything that are putting in a lot of good work. And, you know, do we punish all of them for making for their bosses making bad decisions that are in extremely poor taste? And we're going to talk about some of these different uh situations that we find uh with this community yep I agree. It's, it's a pretty tough it, it's it's tough to create a line and maintain the line because mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I think everybody can relate to just 
like nostalgia kicks in or you get excited about a game mechanic and like blizzard like with them removing the guy's trophy they come back and apologize um which i mean they it's definitely given me pause i don't know if i've if i've completely removed all blizzard games like from my playlist but a big one for me is like right now i refuse to download the epic games downloader because i know that tencent is a huge like a much bigger affiliate with them um uh, so i actually have uh, according to wikipedia they tencent own has uh 40 percent ownership of epic games yeah. mm. wow that's right and, mm-hmm. that, that and they, 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 they got it on i remember that because they didn't spend off they spent a good amount of money, but at the time it was a good deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and like I guess what I'm trying to say is like right now at, at the moment the only company that really makes me not like I've not I will like at the moment I have I have not don't plan on buying anything from Epic Games on their downloader or anything to do with Tencent who has a who has, at least has a sizable share. That's probably the only thing that I've drawn the line with is, is where Tencent has kind of dipped their toes. And now that they're getting into Blizzard and Activision, if they start getting a more sizable share, then you know I might start reconsidering what I'm buying from them as well. Tencent's kind of the main thing I won't affiliate with just because they are known for having some uh, taking over people's privacy and then they're you know with when we start going into like privacy and human rights issues is when i kind of start to get nervous yeah and, and, and the, the government of china <laughs> right I, even like and i've complained they before about literal internment camps right mm-hmm. yeah. I was like, and i've complained before about bioware and like i have no excitement for any of their games they're announcing but that i haven't completely marked them off if they make a good game i'll probably still try it but i'm gonna wait first tencent's probably the only company i've looked at and been like eh, i don't want to mess with that so, does everyone want to get uncomfortable for a quick second? Sounds good. Sure. So, uh, do you know how much, what percent of Activision Blizzard that Tencent owns? I'm going to guess a majority now. Is it Five percent. Okay. Five. Do you Wait, know who they so own? They own? With five yeah. percent, they have that much clout. Jeez. Do you know hmm. who also that has five percent ownership? Uh, that Tencent also has five percent ownership of. They've Ooh. been buying up stuff. Who else? Ubisoft. Mm. Oh, yeah, I think I did hear something about that one. Yep. Mm. Uh, they own they... any partial ownership in, like, EA? They do Where's not. Where's the line? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> they do own 100% of Riot Games, mm-hmm. 100% of Funcom, which I'm not familiar, I'm not familiar with. with them. I can't say oh. I am either. Oh, actually, I'm pulling up their games right now. I'm pulling up their games published. Uh, they published Mutant Year Zero, Conan Exiles. Uh, yeah, at least I've heard of that. Yeah. Mm. And back in the 90s, they published Samurai Showdown and Fatal mm. Fury Special. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, and then uh, another one that they have a pretty large ownership of. Where'd it go? They own 20% of Marvelous. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, hmm. kind of give a frame of reference here. No More Heroes, No More Heroes 2, Desperate Struggle, Damon X Machia, those mm-hmm. are all, uh, God Eater 3, mm-hmm. uh, Rune Factory, those well, are Marvelous all... Marvelous specializes in, like, mostly, you know, obscure... Japanese games that have in previous years otherwise would have never made it to any other shores. Yep. Are they kind of like um, like a, a port the mm-hmm. machine? No, they're a port machine and a dub machine. Yep. Yep. Okay. So here's what I'd like to kind of start with things here. So we can all agree mm-hmm. Tencent bad. The more mm-hmm. clout Tencent has, the worse it gets. Mm-hmm. Let let's start a little broader. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a couple questions to the group here, and these are gonna be hypotheticals. The, these okay. are not actual situations here, but this will kind of help us draw where we draw the lines at. Okay. Say you had a company where, say Nintendo. Okay, Dave. Mm-hmm. Say Adolf Hitler owned forty percent stock in Nintendo. Okay. <laughs> I, I know we're we're starting with the worst of the worst. Mm-hmm. Would you still buy Nintendo? He doesn't own 
Nintendo owns the other 60%, so they have controlling stock. <sighs> Hadouken! Oh, you gotta bleep that one. Sorry. <laughs> I'm being uh, smart and writing down the time this time. All right. Um, you know, that's a tough call because, again, it's a hypothetical, and I'm also kind of like, well, he's dead. So, you know. Okay, let's make it real. Say Trump I'm, invested oh. 40% into Nintendo. Well, there goes half our viewers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you know, no. Uh, you know, it would be a tough call, you know. On the one hand, if I started seeing, you know, overt politis politization how do you say that word? Politization. Politization. <laughs> and uh, the material, I would probably, you know, stop uh purchasing. Um, but you know, if it was just, you know, if it was like a situation, you know, where some companies, you know, like they'll purchase something and then it's just like you know, we just wanted you under our umbrella so we can kind of share resources, but we're otherwise going to leave you alone. You know, like uh, Disney says, seem to have done with Marvel and things like that. Then I would probably be more, I, I still would be a bit iffy, but I'd probably, you know, at least, you know, take a look at what they had to offer, you know. Okay. But it, 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 it's hard at times also because. I, I feel I have a really good method of uh, separating sometimes the art from the artist in that I am a big fan, actually, of the old uh, pulp magazines from the 1930s and 40s, and I really like reading H.P. Lovecraft's uh, horror works. But the more I learn about the guy, the more I hate that guy. He is an absolutely detestable man, you know, yeah. and... He's a racist, anti-Semitic mama's boy, and it's just kind of like, you know, on the one hand, I can really love the material that he has written, but at the same time, knowing that about him, I can have a critical eye when I analyze things. And I can also just say, well, thanks for writing that, HP. He's still the jerk-off, though, you know? So, along mm -hmm. the line of thinking... I don't mean to pick on you, Dave, but I'm going to pick on you just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> How would you feel about, so, I mean, the question that the Tyler asked was, um, what if Adolf Hitler had, like, 40%? I mm -hmm. mean, do, do you think that it should be okay for us to start reading Mein Kampf, right? Uh... I know it's not necessarily, like, you know, video game related topic, mm -hmm. necessarily. It's tan tangentially related. Content, yeah. taking in somebody's content, knowing mm -hmm. what they're in, what they're capable mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, if we, you know, but at the same time, if we threw out every artist, though, who is a terrible person, uh, but still produced wonders, you know, we probably wouldn't have any art left because, I mean, even like Lewis Carroll and them were, you know, insane and stuff like that. So, you know I mean, <laughs> so I think one of the things you had mentioned when you were talking, Dave, kind of draws the line. Does the art, does the product, reflect the negative political or mm -hmm. uh, social views of the contributor right. uh, contributing yeah. person so mm -hmm. mein Kampf, as your example chris that reflects the person yeah sure does yeah yeah mm -hmm. but what if what if uh adolf hitler wrote all the uh, game of throne books they don't Ooh, represent his it doesn't reflect his political views or anything no. so. mm -hmm. well and more to that point we're all kind of appreciating Nazi Germany technology. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't, it was a byproduct of something terrible, but like the V2 rockets, there was, there's a lot of research that was done with the scientists from Nazi Germany afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I just, I'm not as like, so if there's anybody like many listeners, history buffs, like I, I could be completely be butchering this, but I, I thought there was an agreement during Nuremberg trial, trials for a lot of uh, scientists. That was how they stayed out of jail was they agreed to do research for us after World War II. Okay. I, I recently watched Hunters on Amazon, and that was a real, like, a terrible, terrible story. But, yeah, there's a New York Times journalist that actually wrote a piece in, I think, like, in the 2000s. And actually, yes, there are actually war criminals that were brought to the U.S. Um, to help with the NASA program. And their records were mysteriously um, expunged. And uh, I don't know if um, this is um, 
necessarily what what was really called um, in, in actual fact, but in the show it was called Operation Paperclip because mm -hmm. the only thing that was left on the records were the paperclip where the stuff used to be there. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, well, we're getting off track of video games, though. But, <laughs> but, but it, this, this does help us kind of define mm -hmm. what we're looking at. Yeah. So, so essentially, if the content coming out is not reflective of whatever evil doings. I think it seems that's one of the questions that you can ask to say, okay, right. can I support this or not? Mm -hmm. Um, here's the next one I'm going to throw at you guys here. This is an article from Engadget by uh, uh, Bonifacic, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia has invested billions in Activision, EA, and Take Two. This one bothers me. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, in case our listeners don't know, recently you had the one journalist that has was killed by the Saudi prince, or mm -hmm. had been, was killed by the orders of the Saudi prince. Um, so now we have, even if they have no control on the products, you have a murdering monster profiting from every Blizzard game you purchase. Literal blood money involved, right? Now, this... it's, one thing, it's one thing to accept, like, you know, there are going to be, like, corrupted leaders, like, you know, like, you know, let's say Donald Trump was involved, or, like, you know, it... that is a little bit more tolerable than a murderer, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least someone that's involved in the murdering of people. I just wish some of these companies actually, you know, like EA and them, it's just like they think too much with their reptile brain. And, uh, you know, immediately, you know, they hear money, dollars, and then they get the dollar signs, you know, in their eyeballs like a good cartoon. And uh, really, though, it's just like, you know, it just kind of shows, you know, how far they have fallen in some terms and that it's just like, you know, they don't care as long as, you know, because, you know, you know the the money's good you know but but the thing the money's not good is the thing you know it came from you know something terrible you know so really you know i feel a lot of that again again i just you know the problem is is that you know games are both an art as a and a business and oftentimes you know the business part is the one that usually uh, makes all the other parts suffer it seems to be the most and, uh, you know, and then you get, uh, you know, business people sometimes trying to make decisions. Like, you know, we had the situation with uh, Blizzard where uh, the uh, – wasn't the winner from, like, Hong Kong and spoke out about it? He was like, from Hong what? Kong. He was a Hong Kong activist, and mm -hmm. they, they stripped him of his, his winnings, his trophy, his and title. they banned him. Yeah. Yep. And, and uh, uh, I think since then, I think they allowed him to play again. But yeah, I think they retracted. They were like, "Oh, we moved too fast. Like we're gonna, we're gonna they undo didn't, this." I don't think they gave him back like the money or mm -hmm. the, the trophy necessarily. I think no. they let him back in the. Spirit. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look yeah. into that because I thought they gave him half the money back. It, yeah. Now, you know, it it would have been one thing if they had, you know. If it had been like, you know, at the beginning of the game, though, it, they could have covered their bases and just said, oh, you know, uh, you know, this is for fun. This is for video games. You know, no political anything. You know, if you're they did. The United States, they did. That was part of that. the that is part of the rules and the contracts they signed for that. OK, at the beginning, right? For everyone, carte blanche. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, then, yeah. uh, but they I, didn't enforce it. If evenly. Ah, uh, okay. Well, then that that there's the double standard. Okay. Now, yeah. if they had been enforcing it, you know, from the beginning, you know, even anybody, then it's just like, well, yeah, go for it. You know, then I would have been much more understanding. Uh, you know, but you know, if now they're only picking on the Hong Kong person because their five percent shareholder, ooh, uh, comes calling, you know, yeah. You know, I, I just wish companies had a bit more of a spine or these business people that make good decisions. All right. Yeah. No, well, and... Go ahead. No, go ahead, Chris. Oh, 
the the thing that that really makes me fearful with this and when you start involving you know the the chinese government and you know folks that that really aren't great people but because you care so much about their money that you see things like that have happened in in film mm -hmm. right where like uh, the doctor strange film the the tibetan monk uh, mm -hmm. where uh, Doctor Strange is supposed to learn his powers is no longer a Tibetan monk. They don't even mention the word Tibet in the mm -hmm. movie. And it was because they were so afraid of not getting Chinese money because how much um, you know, the Chinese market represents ticket sales mm -hmm. to films. That's the thing that makes me fearful of something mm -hmm. coming into video games that I don't that's happening in other media right literally right now. Yeah. yeah. No it's on the one hand it's just like the the prospect of money has made people cowardly in some regards i feel you know yeah, they're like I well we, we would lose all of you know the asian asian market yeah but at the same time though uh give me your spine you're clearly not using it you know <laughs> and or uh your uh your values your morals that you know and that just seems to be the problem. I've seen a lot of things, you know, with, uh, you know, game companies and things like that. You know, they're perfectly happy saying one thing, but then when the the uh, dump truck of money comes up by, you know, well, then they'll gladly change the tune. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't know the answer to this question here. Hopefully you guys can answer it for me. When a corporation goes public, has public offerings for shares, do they have control of who can buy those shares? Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, so the question then becomes, did EA, did uh, Activision, did they have a choice of Tencent? That is one of the things, though, that you know they may not have had a choice necessarily, but... You know, I guess that is one of the dangers of going public. You know, that would be probably a better question uh, a... for finance kind of people. Yeah, I mean, I know the markets are regulated, but I don't know if they, they keep people out, right? If you've mm -hmm. got money. And that doesn't prevent, like, shell companies and things like that from happening either. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but the follow-up question that is, so say they didn't have um, any say, any control. Mm -hmm. these terrible individuals Tencent, the Saudi prince they're mm -hmm. profiting from these games mm -hmm. is it okay to help for lack of a better term, war criminals profit? Well I would say it's not ever okay to help war criminals mm -hmm. profit but, but so you know. the question then becomes is is it okay to have them get a little bit of profit to not damage all the developers, artists, creatives that that poured their heart and soul into this game. I just wish there was a way for if the situation called for it, like they could be cut out of the equation, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there was like a morality clause or somewhere if you're going to be a day trader or something. Mm. <laughs> Although that's kind of an oxymoron, you know, those two uh, phrases don't... I mean, you know, the, if the Wolf of Wall Street has taught us anything, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Most people that work in that career path are not particularly nice people, I would say. <laughs> uh, did and any of you guys watch the uh, Senate hearing with Robin Hood and uh, about the GameStop stuff? Uh, no, I have not. Mm -mm. I haven't. Oof, that was hard to watch GameStop or not GameStop, uh, Robin Hood defend themselves. Because what it, was it, their rationale explanation? That Out of curiosity. The basically that with how many things that were being bought so quickly, they didn't have the liquidity to uh, cover a call that they are legally required to have due to the Dodds Frank Act, and so they had to stop uh, people buying it. Uh, because selling wouldn't increase the liquidity they needed to have just to buy. Hmm. Okay. That doesn't make any sense. No, it, and, and especially since their initial statement they said never mentioned that, they said our liquidity is fine, and then it's not fine. So, mm -hmm. 
it's... Yeah, I... That Robin Hood's involvement in all of this has been very, very suspicious, honestly. Um, and I use Robin Hood, and I like Robin Hood, or at least I have. Their their stance on this practice was annoying because you know I wanted to buy GameStop stock and was not able to um, uh, at the time. And I bought it, um, and then it tanked because they did it. Yeah. That sucks. Mm. It, yeah, uh, and and it. It's hard to argue that they didn't influence the market because we, the retail investor, mm. right, which is mm. just, um, us. you know, <laughs> the fancy terms for us, regular people, mm. <laughs> yep. were the ones impacted. We were the ones buying it. Mm-hmm. And they stopped us from doing it so the hedge fund people could survive. Yep. Pretty gross and disgusting that they shorted that stock so much that at one point last year, it was two dollars a share. Mm-hmm. Jeez, I wish I had bought it then. <laughs> Holy crap! Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, I know that GameStop may not have the brightest future, but two dollars a share? Come on. Yeah. Come no, on. it's 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 worth more than that, especially with it going into a new console generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, exactly. That, the, the, they had decent profits due to. The Series X PS5 launch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's, they're generating it's... A, generating a lot of site traffic and foot traffic. There are people that mm-hmm. are camping, you know, uh, probably not not the greatest idea with COVID and all that. But there were people that are camping outside to get a console. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, let's get back to the the topic at hand here. So, mm-hmm. questions to ask, but we don't necessarily seem to have an answer for is where do you draw the line of how much profit are you giving to evil entities uh, when they're when the actual developers are creating a product that does not spread their influence? I was actually going to say I was going to piggyback on what Dave was saying is like if these people are investing on a free on a free open market, we don't really have any control. Like we could theoretically completely restrict ourselves from any video games just because any evil person invested in a company that they liked. However. If the evil entity in question starts impacting creativity, then that that opens up a whole other set of questions of like, where do you draw that line? Yeah. It's like if they're not impacting creativity, there's really nothing you can do about it. They, they can anybody can invest in any company they want the way it is right now. You can't really control that. But if they start investing in a lot, like like what you see with certain companies, like if they're buying each other out and they're taking over licenses and re, and they're actually getting creative control over something, and let's say the the prince in question opens up like uses the the investments and he opens up a separate company and they become a developer you know i probably wouldn't support that developer because i knew who it's associated with and then how we got the money but i probably would still be inclined to support like whatever shares that person bought that company itself initially because yeah. if they didn't have creative control they were just investing in an open market they got lucky on a game release and then they did their own thing I guess one of the ways that I can kind of look past it, it, we're going like way deeper down the rabbit hole than I thought we were going to go a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. That's why this is an episode. Of, that's <laughs> why this is an episode of the line. You know? <laughs> um, one of the things I guess that could maybe ease the tension with that though is like, you know, we do have games. Luckily, we still have a used game market, and mm-hmm. uh, what's nice about that though is. You know, really, after the copy of the game has been sold that one time, uh, that is all the money, uh, like for a physical game, that is, that is all the money that that company is going to get out of uh, that copy. Well, if that copy goes used, then it becomes, you know, the profit all goes to the seller. And so, uh, well, I can then, you know, I can always choose to uh, use my dollars to enrich someone else rather than, you know, uh, the... uh, the original product producer. Now, that might not be gross so great for the developer and such like that. Sure. Yeah. The, 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 the only thing that, that... That's a great idea, but that that's only really going to work for, like, single-player games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can't do that with, like, a live service game. Like, hi, the only way to boycott playing uh, League of Legends because it's owned by Tencent is to just not play the game. Mm-hmm. That's, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, I mean, with how entangled it is in esports and uh, such like that. But I, I guess you know, 
I, I guess, you know, we really have kind of find, found the point where I draw my line then is just when, you know, the views and values that, you know, I don't particularly care for start encroaching in on uh, yeah. the material that I am consuming. Um, you know, <sighs> And that's one thing, though, where it's like, I guess, again, I go to Disney, and sometimes they are seen as this evil monster that eats everything. But at the same time, though, they were pretty creative at times because they were really good at the, the shell game, actually, uh, especially in the 90s, because, uh, you know, to get around the fact that uh, they, uh, you know, were actually making more films than just G-rated... They own Touchstone Pictures and I believe Dimension Films. And Touchstone was so they could make PG-13 movies, and Dimension was so they could make rated R films. You know, but then they would release them under those banners, and then you, no one was the wiser until you know basically the advent of the internet, where it's just like, oh wait, this is a uh, oh these lines all connect yeah. to this point. It's <laughs> actually so. Um... That's been the most interesting thing about the the streaming wars, with, mm -hmm. uh, in particular for like uh, TV shows and film, is I've learned so much about who owns what mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of it. Like, oh, okay, I didn't realize this was owned by the same company. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so I want to give an example of a game that's coming out that I feel is very easy to draw the line on, because okay. it's an example of where the investor's view has permeated into the game itself. Okay. Sure. Six days in Fallujah. Fallujah. I thought you were going to say that. Yeah. Man, that, so, that, is that that uh, yep. Iraq war shooter? Yep. It's Benghazi. Mm -hmm. yep. Where it is... At, so I'm looking at an article from Game Rant by Paul Mason. And in the article, they talk about how one of the... Uh, let me see here if I can find it again. There we go. The concerns stem from a past occupation of Victoria CEO Peter Tomate as founder and president of Destineer. That might be a familiar name to some gamers as a publisher of titles such as Age of Empires 2, Age of Empires 3, and Neverwinter Nights. But in 2005, the group partnered with a company called InQtel. InQtel is an organization that invests in technology companies on behalf of the CIA. Uh, mm. to keep the intelligence agency up to date on the latest technologies. This previous association has been cause for concern for those, uh, for some of those in opposition to the game, despite Victoria refuting claims that it's a tool for recruitment. So the whole theory is they're <laughs> painting this as a recruitment game, uh, you mm -hmm. know, positive spin on Fallujah for getting people yeah. into the army. Gotcha. Wow. Mm. They've actually so, already done that before, too. I yeah, ever played yeah. the America's uh, Army. Yes, that which was funded by the Army. <laughs> it was a yeah. they actually advertised. It was a literal mm. recruitment game. They're like, oh, no, it's just, you know, you, you get to just play as a soldier and you yeah, shoot people. And... They had their own E3 booth, but with actual soldiers and a recruitment drone. Yeah. 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 Mm. With, with how much the U.S. military uses drones, mm -hmm. um, I mean... Having someone who's good at video games is actually <laughs> probably a good recruitment tool. <laughs> What's the over under on uh, someone controlling a drone with a PS4 controller? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'd be surprised I mean, if that's already happened. Yeah. Yeah. I would not be surprised. I mean, I don't I know. I've, I've never seen it, but I, I could. It makes sense. Yeah. Get something com uh, that they're comfortable with. <sighs> But I, I think this is a great example of war crimes happened, and now someone is trying to spin it to influence others to view history differently. Mm -hmm. That is something I cannot support. I cannot support the message of the game, which is painting the Iraq war in a positive light, because it was mm -hmm. a hot mess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very much mismanaged, mishandled. We shouldn't have been there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Some of the stuff that happened was very much inappropriate. Um, I mean, we've uh, had hearings. War crimes. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, about it since then. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this is a great example of one, of a game that's easy to draw the line on. 
I yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I have no interest in playing it or supporting it. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you know me. I've said war games. You know, I don't really, I don't mm -hmm. touch them really. Unless you're killing Nazis. <laughs> I think a war game can be appropriate if used to tell a good story or give you mm -hmm. insight into the mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Ironically, Spec Ops The Line that Phil mm -hmm. talked yeah. about. That's a great example where it's not painting it in a positive light. It's, it's telling it an emotional story about right. the mental breakdown of war. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, going back, like that was what uh, Spielberg did with Medal of Honor back in the '90s. He wanted mm -hmm. to, I, I, and I, I've looked for it since then. I can't find where I read this, but I remember reading something that talked about where he wanted to create a story in World War II to show people how it was, and he wanted to do that in every medium. So he created the movie Saving Private Ryan. He created the TV show Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers. And mm -hmm. then he created the video game uh, Medal of Honor. I think he made it even like helped create a book for it too. And I, I don't know what the book was called, but like, again, it was a long time ago. But yeah, that going mm -hmm. back to your point about it was just it was more supposed to be. And I can't say educational because the video game, but at the same time, it, it was more to just like you said, show the light of what it was. You like. know, I mean, game video games can be educational, right? At one point in time, mm -hmm. they um, after the Notre Dame uh, burnt down uh, in Assassin's Creed, um, I can't remember which one it was, but they actually oh, yeah. let you go do tours of it. And that's something that is, it's a historical artifact at this point that mm -hmm. if it wasn't for someone that recreated it, you wouldn't be mm -hmm. able to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, with some game company practices, though, that there have been some, though, where it's just like they've really easily uh, been able to, you know, lose my support. Uh and, you know, mostly, you know, again, with like for financial reasons that they've done. Uh, one of the topics that I wanted to discuss that was kind of like a scummy game practice, but, you know, kind of where I drew the line. And it's kind of when the game company draws the line themselves, you know, they really they, they do a kind of, you know, cut off their nose to spite their face kind of things. Like uh, EA is a textbook example of this. And uh uh, Nintendo, while a favorite company of mine, is, is not uh, innocent of this as well. Um, you know, there are still people, you know, like I loved the Dead Space series. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Dead Space 1 and Dead Space 2 were great. I enjoyed Dead Space 3, but I'll definitely admit it's the weakest of all the three of them. But what we see with that, though, is EA, in its long storied practice, of buying up developers, you know, to get their hands on these uh, franchises that they have, but then they start adding in basically the EA way of doing things, which is usually not really appreciated, and then, you know, it flounders, and then, you know, they're of the mentality, well, well, you guys didn't like the last one, so clearly, you know, you know this franchise is done with it, it's just just no, we love the franchise. We just don't like it when you do it, you know? <laughs> well, that, that's, uh, like, that's always baffled me, you know? Mm -hmm. Hey, man, they did a really great product. Let's buy mm -hmm. them so we can profit off it, but then tell them how to do it so it's no longer their actual project. Yeah, like with Dead Space 3, they added in microtransactions mm -hmm. for the stupidest of reasons. There was a crafting system in the game, which it did not need because neither of the other two had it they forced in a multiplayer mode which wasn't needed as well even though i did have fun with it with my brother after hearing what the other the developer said about it and what they wanted to do with it though but if ea eventually just said nope we got to get it out the door it's just like well you guys did everything to set themselves up to fail you know it's right. easy for me to not support you because you're not turning out anything I want. You know, the mm -hmm. last EA game I have purchased really was uh, Mirror's Edge Catalyst. And it's just like... But that was... Uh, you weren't really boycotting it for they're doing bad practices or anything like that. You were doing mm -hmm. it because you just didn't like the game or, or you thought that the game was being tarnished by their practices. Well, I think it, there's a difference between the two, right? But at the same time, I feel, though, it is a very shady practice, though. You know, 
there are people, you know, by taking something that people do want and then just completely, you know, kind of, you know, destroying it by sitting on it, you know, or, you know, but or using these shady business practices that no one particularly likes and then, you know, shoehorning it in so much that, you know, I guess the argument could be made that's a kind of set of values that, you know, are being shoehorned into the game that are obvious and that we don't want. And then people do start voting with their dollars, you know, like mm-hmm. Dead Space 3, unfortunately. I mean, that's the only way that we that we can actually push and control or change anything in the industry. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, that's true for anything, right? We do have to vote for our wallet. If you know, there's a company that's you know doing things that we shouldn't, that they that we don't want them to do, and we really are against it, we really shouldn't support them. I mean, and luckily mm-hmm. we have managed to change the tide of some things, which has been good. Uh, I mean, the there's success, right? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, look at what happened with uh, with Star Wars Battlefront, right? Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. There was such a rejection of that game that mm-hmm. Bob Eager mm-hmm. from uh, Disney called mm-hmm. EA, and mm-hmm. all of a sudden that that microtransaction policy for Battlefront Two was mm-hmm. reversed. Yeah, really, that is the one thing that also has made Blizzard also a bit of a dinosaur and that they're perfectly happy continuing on this antiquated loot box system with Overwatch, where right. it seems like a lot of games are trying to get away of, from it because of the bad press. Uh, so, other things that we have had win at, we have won on. Sorry, Tyler, I, I do want to finish yeah, this thought sure, before sure, it sure. lose it completely. Sure. Um, there's been other th- arguments, though, that we have won. Um, we have done better, I think, with some downloadable content where I say better in some with some companies, not so with others. But you know how uh, there is there was like the diagrams where they show like, you know, where they basically it shows the game. But then it's like, oh, we took this chunk out. That's DLC one. This is DLC two. The, I mean, EA even cut off the real ending of Dead Space 3 and made it DLC as the lost chapter. It was the ending to the game. It ended the story. And they made it DLC. I'm just like, how ridiculous can you get? And then Capcom did it as well with uh, Asura's Wrath. And then, you know, after like two instances of that, they very quickly realized... Wow, people do not like that. And I haven't really heard of any other game company doing it since. Also, there was the instance with Street Fighter Cross Tekken, which I loved as a game, but then people found out, wait, all the characters are on the disc? So you mean the disc I own has everything on it, but you are going to charge me more money for the six additional characters that I can't access. And it wasn't like an insubstantial amount. It was like $15. And it's just like, I was trying to justify it at the time, but even then it's just like, you know, what happened? And there's actually a very good uh, internet series called What Happened, which explains some of these like corporate greed stories. And some of them are actually pretty entertaining and and some of them are just downright depressing. (laughs) So to bring it back, I guess, to the topic, do do those practices stop you from buying the games or buying the DLC or buying for you personally? In some cases, yes, it did. Or at least made me wait until it was like, you know, a complete edition or a revised edition where, you know, oh, everything's on it, you know, so they didn't get, you know, with DLCs, though, there are situations though, where they would make more money off me if I had bought the game at launch for the full $60 in the sale, which would have been another probably 10 bucks each time. You know, by the whole thing's over, they would have probably made a 100 to $120 off of me. But, you know, by voting with my dollars and not doing that, you know, it kind of forces them to, you know, sometimes, well, here's the full, like, collector's edition. Okay, boom, then you got my money. But usually, you know, then it's like $60. So, you know, that's how I vote with my money on that stuff. And it's worked out so well so far. 
And with those practices, though, I do have – the point I was making is we did, I think, win those fights because I have not seen a game, you know, cut off its ending or cut out a notable section of story – to be used as a downloadable content necessarily, or even leave things on the disc to be found later, you know? So, mm -hmm. question for, and this doesn't have to be just for Dave, but for anyone. Um, should, mm -hmm. we, with this evidence that voting with our wallet can mm -hmm. and has been effective, should we use it against companies that you know implement crunch right where they make their workers work 60 hours a week or seven days straight i mean they're not being regulated by any type of industry there's there are no unions in in the video game and well that's not true i think there's one yeah. Well, yeah. The, the industry needs to unionize they needed to yeah. unionize 10 15 years ago but 100 percent agree yeah but uh you know i think uh, like I think the short answer is that, like, yeah, we probably could and should if we were able to, but it would be really difficult to band together that well, that consistently, and being able to band together that consistently might actually end up being dangerous. And at the uh, same time, the issue that we have is, you know, we know about this stuff because this is mm -hmm. our form of entertainment. Like, you know, mm -hmm. for the average Joe Schmo, what's ten cent? You know, right, right, you know. You know, it, and and that's the problem. It's just sometimes you know it takes so much effort to get people to care about this stuff that uh, mm -hmm. you know. And, and at the end of the day, it is entertainment. It's not like you know, it's not like other things that are entertainment is fluff in life. And while it's wonderful, it isn't necessarily essential all of the time. So I'm actually going to disagree with you slightly here, Dave. Mm -hmm. especially during these times of covid video games are socialization that's how kids play with that each other true. right now that they can't true. do it physically it is feeling the social uh, the social emotional needs of so many people of interacting with others mm -hmm. well you do got me there but you know mm. good job sir i can you <laughs> check <laughs> So to answer Chris's question, um, I think that we should start uh, really contemplating, you know, how much crunch do, crunch do they go through? Was it mandatory? We need to take those factors in. And if there's mm -hmm. something egregious, if the GameStop stock thing has taught us anything, is the internet can band together and screw over those who screw over other people. You know, I, yeah. I shorting stocks seems like the shadiest business to me because people are profiting off of their consumer's loss. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's it's someone taking advantage of their own clients. So mm -hmm. my so my question is, you know, if people can band together and seek them, if people will spend thousands of dollars on a stock they know is tanking just to teach Wall Street a lesson. Mm -hmm. If we see an egregious act, why can't we as gamers band together and do that too? Yeah, no, and mm -hmm. that, that's that. I think that's that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, I think I, said, I think I think it's a good concept. I think it's possible, uh, just very difficult. Mm -hmm. and I think it yeah. would. I think it's something that can and has been applied, but at the same time, um. When I was saying like it could be dangerous, I could also see it. The, the way it would be dangerous is that if you would have groups of people forming just to steer everything the way that they want to see it, and that would Trolls. that would that would be just as detrimental, and it would it would ruin creative control for the for a lot of the developers who may even be genuine, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but conceptually, I I think being able to do that, like like you know, voting with our wallet is is effective and that people should do mm -hmm. ultimately if you care about it you know really you should be doing you know your homework i mean mm -hmm. i guess that's one of the other reasons why a lot of us are so disappointed in blizzard is because you know it used to be their philosophy is the game's done when it's done you know mm -hmm. and uh, then when they suddenly were bought up by activision and became active <laughs> Mm -hmm. The uh, <laughs> that philosophy became uh, a merger, merger. 
No, the, the it, Activan has been trying to activize or however you want to mm -hmm. call it, Blizzard. Mm -hmm. They actually, their CEO uh, said that they were not prolific enough, that they needed mm -hmm. to make more games. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then they cut their, st uh, their staff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, on a positive note, I heard that the original Blizzard crew that want, I have actually they've left and have made another company, and we might still be getting more of those uh, "it's done when it's done" style games of mm -hmm. people who actually care about their product as opposed mm -hmm. to the company wanting to improve their and, bank account. And that's been great here, you know, because though we love IPs, we mm -hmm. love the actual gameplay they represent far more. Uh, mm -hmm. in Inafune, is that his name, the Castlevania character, uh, creator? Uh, yes. No, uh, KG no. Inafune was Mega no, Man. That's Mega Man, that's right. Okay. Uh, no, Igarashi. Igarashi, right. thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Bloodstained, uh, that's not Castlevania, but mm -hmm. it feels like Castlevania. Yeah. It's it's a darn good game. and <laughs> It's like, I can't believe it's not Castlevania. Right. right, but to the point where I don't care that it's not Castlevania, because Castlevania stories are so convoluted, it might as well be Castlevania. It's got exactly. that great gameplay loop that was what really drew people in. And I I know some people were disappointed by it this week, but, you know, ultimately, you know, I'm not too upset about it, though, when, you know, uh, A.G. Aonuma, you know, walked out for the Nintendo Direct. Look, I know you were all probably expecting Breath of the Wild 2 news. Uh, the news is we've got nothing to show at the moment. It, it is coming along, but mm -hmm. we don't feel it's out of state to show off. And, you know, that is as disappointing as it is to hear, as disappointing as it is to hear nothing about, you know, Metroid Prime 4. And the, there is the reason there is the old adage, no news is good news, okay? Yeah. Because clearly they are taking their time on it. There have been situations, you know, like... Uh, with like Star Fox Zero, uh, we're currently going to take that and delay it a couple months because uh, what was it? They wanted to work on more of the feel of the game, and really, what you should have done is taken another year and made it so those stupid controls with the gamepad were freaking optional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was honestly the most exciting uh, announcement with Skyward Sword for the Switch, mm -hmm. is you don't have to use motion controls. I know, and even though yeah. that is tied for my favorite Zelda with Breath of the Wild, but that's because of its story. Its story. That is Not why I gameplay. like that one. Yep. The gameplay, yeah, I, I, know, I was fine with it, but I can understand, though, why some people could have a hard time with it. Um, there were things I liked about it. There were things I wish were a little better, but overall, its story is what really enthralled me. But now, I am actually looking forward to playing it again and trying out that right stick sword combat, because I'm just like, that sounds even more interesting to me than the stupid motion controls were going to be. <laughs> You know, I don't have to worry about, and I'm wondering also if it's going to be maybe a bit more um, responsive, because that starts to remind me of, uh, even though it's another game that you know some people were like eh, on, but Metal Gear, uh, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. <laughs> oh, that game was so good. Uh, it, it, it was fun, but you remember it had the same kind of idea with using the control stick on the right side to aim a slash. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like, okay, sounds good to me. Or using the Metal Gear Rising Revengeance controls. Okay, awesome. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, you know? I still really like it. I know I'm going to get downvoted to oblivion. Uh, so, <laughs> so for all of our average 25 listeners, uh, please don't downvote me because I like Skyward Sword and... Uh, Metroid Other M and uh, <laughs> Yoshi Story. <laughs> you know, Skyward Sword is a game that I own and have never played. I never finished it. I, I, I it didn't capture me enough. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I got it for the Wii, and 
just never picked it up. Mm. Yeah, I thought that it was one of those things where like I really liked the the motion controls. I thought it was really novel, unique. And then after a while, I got tired of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it's definitely not the perfect Zelda, and even then, I. I I don't think any any game is truly perfect. You know, there's always something worth of critique in any game. But, uh, you know, in terms of the storyline, I always love a good origin story. And with that game, it answered and brought up a lot of, like, really cool, interesting things. It explained why there's a hero the, every hundred years, why Princess Zelda is so special, why Ganondorf is so special, you know? And it even opens the door for, like, they could go a step earlier and do even crazier stuff with that. And it was, you know, the origin of the Master Sword. Also, it introduced the concept of a dark counterpart to the Master Sword, which they haven't touched upon again yet, because it's only been in one game. So, I want to see that! <laughs> mm hmm mm hmm So I think right. where we've landed tonight is it's hard to draw the line. There's there's thing there's questions you can ask, and then you just have to ask yourself, can I live with this? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, uh, I think what we all want to see is just a developer that cares about their product, even if it's not necessarily something that we personally enjoy. Just care mm -hmm. about it as opposed to padding their pockets. Sometimes making the right decision, you know, isn't you know the easy decision or even necessarily the the popular decision you know mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. i've said many times you know you know i do wish some game companies you know had a bit more of a spine you know or, or you know or also you know had a bit more of you know a bit more than just a lizard brain at times ah, damn it. what are you gonna make me do for this money <laughs> i'm an honest ho <laughs> you know <laughs> but uh I, I wish there was more of that, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, you know, everyone seems to be susceptible to that, you know, even us at times. <laughs> Wait, you'll give me how much money if I do draw what kind of picture for you? How much? <laughs> <laughs> Man, you drew uh, so much Sonic fan art that day, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I have never drawn Sonic fan art for anyone. However, I would. This did make me think of something. If you ever want to play a fun game with friends, put your name into the Google search, followed by the Hedgehog, and just oh. see what weirdness comes up. <laughs> and probably should get an NSFW warning on that for some. Yeah. Of them. <laughs> so I kid and you if not. You life and everything with that goes with it turns safe search off <laughs> so funny story about that uh i know chris is familiar with it uh the kind of funny games uh daily podcast i actually a couple uh, about a year and a half ago two years ago wrote in and mm -hmm. just and it was uh tim gettys and gary widow on and i said fun game to play you know enter your name the hedgehog into a google search and they did it on the air <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, i'll have to find that clip sometime because that was uh, oh man that's amazing that's good stuff <laughs> good content mm -hmm. <laughs> all right here so i feel oh. like we need i'm sorry go ahead dave oh, no just ultimately you know i think some of the best things you could do is just you know folks be cognizant you know about things Unfortunately, the world has, unfortunately and fortunately, uh, there has been much good that has come from it, but there's also been so much not so good for it. But I think as long as people are cognizant and make choices based on that sometimes, you know, ultimately we can lead to making, you know, better changes. And we have won some of these fights. We have. Mm -hmm. uh, we just got to keep doing it because <laughs> business will be business. <laughs> yep. A great example of a company making a long step, but listening to their client base. Uh, Xbox, when they were going to increase the price of Xbox Gold, yep. the internet <laughs> exploded, and they mm -hmm. course corrected immediately. 
us speaking another, up. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. I was just saying, Xbox was another example. Remember the debacle that was the launch of the Xbox One? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, every, people went nuts, and you know, we voted with their dollars. We bought PlayStation Fours, and Xbox went from being top dog on the generation previous to you know, low man on the totem pole with this one. So, yeah, you know, we can uh, we can change people's minds, uh, but unfortunately, again, it maybe you know is making not the most fun decision all the time. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, capitalism is ran by money. And mm -hmm. um, the only way that we can affect change is with our money. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yep. So let's 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 do something to kind of brighten the mood before the end of the podcast here, because we got dark yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> so we're syrup shots gaming, and we're here to make you think about death and get sad and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Th thank you, sex bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to talk about a game that I've been having a lot of fun with this week. Uh, okay. What are you playing? Guilty Gear Strive. <laughs> Crap, that was the game you told me to download that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> go yeah, start it. it. Yeah, go start it now. Go start it. Well, nah. when we finish, oh, when we yeah, finish, yeah, when yeah, we yeah, finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, uh, it it is gorgeous like i can't believe how good that game looks uh it's crazy town banana pants uh, there's a doctor that has a, a a paper sack over his head that can make doors that appear out of nowhere and then he'll switch into a guy with a beanie hat swinging a baseball bat wow okay is, there there's uh, a not so yeah there's a new girl in it that the only way i can describe her is a girl wearing overalls with a thunder puppy <laughs> I uh, I told my girlfriend we're going to be playing tonight, and she wants to see it because I told her it's a boob game. What'd you say, Dave? Only overalls? No, not only overalls. Uh, Button-up okay. shirt and pants. Okay, uh, well, I'm thinking we're taking, you know, lessons from the Dead or Alive uh, school of costumes. <laughs> no, so... That's only if there are physics for certain, you know, body parts. The uh, I guess the water balloons and the earthquake physics. Actually, in Guilty Gear Strive thus far, they don't have any character that is female that's outlandish like that okay there there is well, no dizzy there's no um biken are, are any of you guys familiar with the character biken yes they are so, I, I thought guilty gear was known for being kind of a doa-esque uh fighter it's an anime 2d fighter mm -hmm. well i just mean with the the, the boobage uh, not as much as you think Okay. Now, now there are there are exceptions. It's Biken, Irish, right? oh <laughs> yeah. So Biken is is bad blank. I mean, she is. Imagine a samurai who has lost an eye, has lost an arm. She when she's attacking, she'll send a chain out of her dead arm out of that sleeve to grab you. Mm. But with here. like with like the but, most cleavage on the planet. So have they taken these characters and toned them down, or have they just removed them? Because they're Dizzy not. And... They're not in Strive yet. So Strive oh. is a new game coming out. Uh, so there's going to be 15 characters at launch, and then there's DLC pass. I so, see. So this is like uh, yeah. I can't, okay. It, it's uh, it's the fourth Guilty Gear game because the last one before this was Guilty Gear Gear XR. Mm -hmm. uh, which is supposed to be the third, but just X instead of three. And this okay. is Strive with the IV in the center. Oh. Mm. Okay. Like, um, like Resident Evil Village. Right. Yes. Mm. Uh, but there was, there was like Guilty Gear X Art uh, Sign, Guilty Gear X Art Rev, and Guilty Gear X Art Rev 2. It's, it's like the three versions of Street Fighter 3. Where they added, games are dumb sometimes. But they added more characters. So they always start off with kind of like a base roster and then build it up over the years to keep people coming back to it. So I mm -hmm. imagine they'll come back at some point. And there's still one more character they need to announce, but go and get back to Guilty Gear Strive. It is not quite as fast as the old Guilty Gears. It's more accessible. And it is just 
a visual treat. Uh, chef kiss. <laughs> Chef's kiss. <laughs> nice. So well, uh, highly recommend checking it out. Well, I uh, as I said last week, started up Killer uh, uh, from the makers of Killer Seven. I started Killer is Dead uh, okay. last week. Um, that is exactly the kind of weird that I wanted it to be. Um, it, it's interesting. The story is going places. I'm not sure if any of them are connected. Uh, I, uh, there were some things I was not expecting in this game, though. There is a dating and romance uh, sections of this game. And uh, you build points by basically... You can put on X-ray vision glasses to see these young ladies in uh, in their unmentionables, oh, and you gain god. points by staring at their erogenous zones. Oh my but god! You got to do it without them seeing that you're doing this. I was. What are you playing? I, He's uh, playing Gal Gun. <laughs> <laughs> so I was unaware of this part of the game. Okay. <laughs> But however, what's funny is uh, this is one of the best ways to get uh, experience in the game that you could use to level up your character. That is definitely an experience. Yes. Uh. And each time, though, <laughs> so like the first time you win the game, you see a partial cunt scene, and you basically see the main character like turn his back and go, yeah, you know, with the thumbs up. Uh. The next time, it goes further. The next time you basically see the scenes like in a Bond movie leading up to said action. And then the third time, it, it, it's kind of like a God of War game all over. And it's like, oh, God. Oh, thank God there's no one else here. Knocking Wait, over that water base. I got a giant TV! My window's open! Crap! <laughs> I'm going to get a letter from the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> The homeowners association is gonna have a gun pointed at my head. <laughs> I didn't realize you lived in the south. <laughs> no, I don't have a homeowners association. No, but that that would be the the that would be all I needed though. Just watch. If I did, there would be some Karen at the door immediately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're watching lewd content on your TV. Yeah, in my own house. And I didn't know that was going to happen. It happened three times. Okay, well, I knew about it the third time, but I needed to get more experience points. <laughs> that that and I would raise the question, you saw it three times. Why were you watching that long? <laughs> well, you got to play it each time to get the experience points. No, 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 no. Why is, the, why is the Karen watching you play it that much? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, you got nothing better to do? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you go away. I'll send you a letter for being, you know, a pervert for, you know, uh, using your binoculars to look at me in my, <laughs> through my windows. You're like Shia LaBeouf in Disturbia, but you're not going to find a murderer. <laughs> and on that kind of odd, <laughs> crazy note, this has been Show Up Shots Gaming. Uh, Chris, <laughs> last thoughts? I don't know. I have no words. I have no words, Dave. Thank you so much. <laughs> Phil, last thoughts? I, I killed the mood. <laughs> Bottoms up. Bottoms up. <laughs> so everyone, be conscious with your purchases. Be safe. Be kind. Bottoms up.